Get it, guys. Back at the Earth Circle, and joining me is my co-host Cat. Ahoy, ahoy. And today we're going to talk about Games Workshop and their paints. Uh, so obviously there's a price rise coming, and the target of this price rise is their paints. Uh, a lot of people out there are defending the move, uh, saying that it's good of them to tell us in advance that it's coming. Personally, I don't think it's worth praising the company for doing something that everyone else naturally does. Uh, in any case, however, we decided to look at it in depth today. Uh, and the way we're doing it is we're actually going to go back and have a look at their prices in the past on paints, what they charged, how they've gone up in sort of relation to inflation and wages. And then we're going to look at the different sort of alternatives available that Cat and I have tried. Uh, there are other paints available that aren't listed here today, but we've gone for the ones we've both tried. Um, so hopefully people will find this informative and it'll give them a few options that they may or may not want to take up. Now obviously we can't tell you whether or not to buy from Games Workshop. We're not the authority on that. We can't say whether what they're doing is right or wrong because as a company it's up to them to charge whatever they feel like. I think it's important to stress. However, it doesn't mean that you as a consumer have to put up with it. Is that fair to say, Kat? Yeah, all fair. Uh, sense, but I mean, it's hard to try and take a, a neutral standpoint, especially with the commenters that we get on the videos, but it's done our best, I suppose. Uh, it's interesting to see from Games Workshop's standpoint, um, from a marketing pr perspective, you can, if you tell people that the price is going to go up in a couple of weeks, that's when you can expect people to come in and stock up on your lower price. So you, you can, you know, that is a way marketing can work in your favor sometimes. Oh, so sure. all those people who wouldn't go out and buy their paints right now, all of a sudden are going to go out and go, well, it's cheaper to do it now, and they'll go out and buy a bunch of paints they might not necessarily need. Yeah, or people will stock up. The people that do only buy it occasionally will stock up now rather than later. So they can get to the paints when they're dried up later? <laughs> yeah, that's it. They're not great seals. They still don't have great seals, do they? They seem to be getting worse over the years. Yeah, I, um, I'll um i put up a little infographic right now that shows some of the previous paint pots um, the Games Workshop's put out. But it's almost like they've been using a team of scientists to perfect the art of making paint pots seal worse over time. So. And also spillage to be more commonplace than... <laughs> yeah, they do spill a lot easier now, don't they? Uh, yeah, okay, so anyway, first slide that we've got here, we actually go all the way back to White Dwarf issue 190 back in 1995, October of 1995. Now, Kat, you have a pretty comprehensive White Dwarf collection, and this is from your own personal collection, is it not? It belongs in a museum, but yes, yes, I do. Very good. And yes, it is. So, obviously, this has a list of prices for their miniatures, and I was able to dredge up in this section, and when I say I, I mean Kat, the cost of the paints back in 1995 in Australia, which was $2.95. Now the current price the Games Workshop is selling them for, and I'm saying the price in 2018, because obviously 2019 is where we're going to have our price rise. So for future people who watch this video and go, hang on a minute, that wasn't the price in 2019, yeah, that's why I've written 2018. In any case, inflation has gone up 57.5% since 1995. So basically things cost half as much again these days, or almost two thirds as much again, uh, as they did back in the 90s. That happens with every country, especially Zimbabwe. Um, <laughs> where, yeah, it, like in, like in America, they call him 50 cent. In Zimbabwe, in Zimbabwe, they call him 20 billion dollar man. <laughs> so, uh, Games Workshop, however, their prices have gone up 203%. So, more than double in that same time frame. So, obviously, their prices are leaping ahead much faster than our wages and other goods in the country going up. That's a bad thing, because especially things like uh, technology, like phones, that sort of thing, proportionally get cheaper over time for what they offer. So Games Workshop, on the other hand, they go the opposite way. They get more expensive over time. 
there's a few conspiracy theories I've got about that, but we'll get to those later. So the next slide I'm going to bring up here is looking at White Dwarf number 255 from March of 2001. So this one's notable because this is back when the ABCD type pricing was in play still. Uh, a few of the older listeners here are probably pretty familiar with this. I know you and I probably lived off this cat. Uh, yeah. packs. We, we knew it instinctively what cost what, didn't we? <laughs> um, so back in the 90s and the early 2000s, instead of price tagging things, they would just put a letter on them to say all these items cost this much. And Yeah, late, late 90s, early 2000s, yeah. Yeah, so... In this instance, uh, we've got the spray cans from Games Workshop, which were a Band D item, which is $16 Australian. Now, the current price is $29. So that's a 207% price rise in 17 years. That's now, still, that back then it was still a lot for a can of Black Primer for 16 bucks. Yeah. You can still go to Bunnings <laughs> and get get a can of Primer for half that amount. Yes, it, that's quite expensive. 2001 prices um, now obviously nobody here their wage unless you've gone up in position in your company like you know you're a CEO or something now uh, no one's wage has gone up double since 2001 the rate of inflation since then is only like 40% so they've pretty much gone up mm, a bit more say two and a half times faster than what our wages are going up now obviously that's pretty bad because over time if it kept up at these rates it would become simply unaffordable. The next one along here is another one of Kat's classic collection, White Dwarf 303 from March 2003. Uh, in this we have a paint pot price it's now risen to four dollars so remember it was $2.95 back in 1995. Eight years later it's four dollars so it's gone up 25 percent. Now, the inflation rate for our country is 2.5% average, for those who are wondering, uh, provided by the Australian Bureau of Statistics and the Reserve Bank of Australia, who are pretty credible when it comes to their financial matters. I wouldn't trust them as far as I could throw them. Well, you never trust a bank. But anyway, $4 each. So they've gone up a lot more than inflation again. Now, the reason we're showing this is because we like to provide our sources when we get our information. We know a lot of people who come on this channel like to say we're just haters. We just find any excuse to hate on Games Workshop. But right now, we're giving you all the information you need so you can make up your own mind, your own opinion. Do you think it's right for paints and paint cans and stuff to double in cost at the same time your wages are only going up half as much? I don't think that's sustainable. And... It's worked for Games Workshop so far, but there's got to be a tipping point there. So, with all this data in mind, I compiled this handy little graph. What does it tell you? Well, first of all, you'll see those blue bars. The blue bars on the graph are the Games Workshop prices that they charge for these items. The orange bars are taking the initial starting point of $2.95 and increasing it by inflation. So each year, the amount that's listed will go up by the cost of inflation. In any case, as you can see, over time, Games Workshop's price is starting to slowly outstrip the inflation. And what happens is, if we go to our next slide, just as the inflation is catching up to the Games Workshop price, they move the goalposts. So when people say, oh, Games Workshop deserves to raise the prices, they haven't raised their price in you know, five years, which seems to be the average, um, five or six years, I think Kat worked it out to. Um, yeah, they they just are setting a price so ludicrously high back when they priced their product that it's able to beat inflation or beat price rises for the however many years in a row. Now, what this does is it increases their short-term profits. You go from charging $4 for something to $5 for something overnight, and the wages of people around you and what the purchasing power is of a person hasn't changed, well, all of a sudden, that whole extra dollar you're charging is basically money in the bank for you. Now, this is obviously fantastic news for Games Workshop, not very good news for the consumer. 
And when people look at it and they go, oh, they haven't raised their prices in so long, it's because they haven't had to. It's because they're actually making more money just after the price rise. And it's only once that profit margin starts to thin out a bit after a few years, that's when they do their price rise. Now, this is very noticeable for this current year because what the paint pots should cost is $4.64 if you're going off inflation adjusted amounts from 1995. But Games Workshop is already charging $6 and it's about to go up, which is why I ended that red line with a question mark. Because as you can see, the cost of their paint is far outstripping how much more money we have in our own pockets in order to spend on this hobby. That's a problem. So, with all of this data in mind, we end up at this final slide here. And this is the one we're going to be spending the majority of this episode looking at. Obviously, these are the prices you can buy each of these different types of paint brands off eBay or any sort of third-party seller for. Expect about this price. Obviously, there'll be some variance up or down. But what I've done is put the Games Workshop corn red and I've also put down a set of prices straight out of eBay of what you can expect for the other paints and how much paint you get in comparison to Games Workshop as well as how much of the percent of the Games Workshop price it is. So Kat, would you like to take off on this one? Uh, yep, so first off we have the normal Citadel top left corner, you have the Citadel uh, that would be the red corn paint, AU $6. Sure, you can go to a shop, maybe get 20% off uh, at your best or online store in Australia. But then you got your next contestant over there, number two, which is Vallejo Model Air Off-White. that You don't just necessarily need to have, they have a lot of, paints in the Vallejo line. They don't just have Model Air, they also have uh, the uh, war type model paints and then they also have the game color type paints which aren't, they're not as thin, as thinned out as the Vallejo um, paint pots but the, the Vallejo Model Air, their pigment is really thin so it'll get through a 0 0.3, 0 0.4 model airbrush with minimal uh, thinning. So what uh, that, that's just one of the other uh, arguments. One of the uh, one of our members said, "It's like, oh, because it's not thinned out. Because the palm red is a thick paste, basically. You get more if you thin it out out of a 10 mil bottle than a Vallejo uh, 17 mil body bottle, which is false. I'd say you're getting the same amount of uh, distance per mil of these paints. You're going to get the same draw distance. So I don't understand." Well, that. something that a lot of people fail to take into account, Kat, um, when we use these products, so the Vallejo Model Air is just indicative of Vallejo paints, as an example of what the average dropper bottle costs. With Vallejo, I can squirt out exactly how much paint I want from that bottle, and I can even put it back in if I really want to with ease. I can't do that with Games Workshop's paints, because their paint pots are a very different design. So whatever I take out of that pot and put on a palette, it's there to stay. It's not going back in that pot. Mm, if you're using an airbrush, you know, you can pour your um, hopper back into uh, either pots, but I understand. There's, with the Games Workshop one, it's also on the floor because uh, it spilled it because a slight wind came in through. So, yeah. Games Workshop right. paints are notorious for spilling. Uh, the at the bigger the bottle... The bigger the bottle, the worse they are. I think with the uh, the washers uh, and inks and stuff that they have now are worse for it because they're they're top heavy or something. I'm I'm not certain, but very very tall for their uh, surface area, their base covers. Definitely, and you see a lot of people trying to convert their Citadel paints into dropper bottles. It's like why not just cut the middleman out there, spend less time doing that, spend less money, and get a better product at the end of the day <laughs> so, so i don't know what the, the idea is they're just making more it's like digging a hole but instead of using you know a shovel uh you're just using a fork it seems unnecessary <laughs> uh, so they're in the army great to know um number two obviously is our vallejo so how would you rate vallejo performance for you personally 
it probably takes up 80% of my paints in my repertoire of paints that I have. Uh, the dropper bottle makes it easy. They've got a huge uh, variety of colors. Anything that can match Games Workshop. There's multiple charts online that you can go through to try and color match. Um, they have like the different ranges. They've just brought out another range that has uh, a gaming line that is for physical use of models because you're always touching those tabletop board gaming models rather than um, just display pieces. They've made these are even harder versions, which I haven't had the uh, chance to get a hold of yet. But I want to get into that range as well. So that that it's just a great, yes, yeah, it's, it's a readily available at shops online. Uh, you can get your twenty percent discount like that online shops as well. So it's uh, yeah. How about you? Uh, yeah, no, I love it. The I won't say the majority of my paints, but a fair body amount of my airbrush paints are the way home. All my really high performance paints, um, I'll call them, because I know I'm getting consistency out of them, which I might not necessarily get with other brands or cheaper brands. Vallejo has never let me down, which is really something to their credit. Um, one good thing that they do is they actually also sell their primers. I know other brands do this, but I'm pretty sure Games Workshop doesn't sell 100ml bottles of primer for a really decent price actually so i have a bottle of gray primer for example and i use it to base coat a lot of my miniatures now a primer is a harder wearing paint and it's the first coat you'll sort of lay down on a miniature in order to it creates like a texture a really you know, microscopic surface texture which helps the additional really thin coats of paint that you're going to apply later stick better to the base miniature and vallejo has a brilliant set of primers available so uh, really good value in the Vallejo, um, and yeah, only 83% of Games Workshop price, uh, and this is before any discounts, and with 170% more paint, that's pretty good value. Yep, and they've also got a bunch of other products in their line, such as uh, their textured sands uh, through to uh, thinners, because I put even with my model air, I'll put a couple of drops of their thinner in there, uh, some water, and then the paint as well. Mix it all in. Yeah, and really good flowing then it's good to, to... Yeah, definitely. And yeah, some of the texture stuff, they've got water, um, different types of water effects, different types of sand, mud, concrete. I mean, yeah, definitely. It's, it's a one-stop shop, but you could definitely just work off of... All right, so number three, MIG. So MIG is one I haven't used too much of, but I've been really impressed with the results of the ones I have used. Now, the thing is, I'm in that bit of a funny spot where I have a lot of Vallejo model air and game air paints. So I don't really have any incentive to swap to MIG because I'm getting performance on one out of the paints I've got. You know, um, if you've got a great car from a company that you like, well, Often you'll end up going with that same car or car company, won't you? Well, it's the same sort of thing with the paints. MIG, I think, is pretty much on par with Vallejo for performance, but I don't have any real desire currently to move over to it. What about you, Cal? Uh, yeah, same again, like yourself, but they do have some specific items that they don't, that Vallejo don't use. So, for example, their pigments. Uh, and some of their more technical stuff, some very specific items. So I'd use their, uh, their, what powder do I have here? So it's a, uh, a soot powder that I have from them and a, a rusting effect as well. So that is something that cuts out a lot of uh, other steps, otherwise that I could use with either using oils or, or mixing other generic brand pigments to it. So. They can have. They have a lot of technical um, items. Is it not necessarily paints? So I've only got one or two of their paints. But yeah, like like yourself, because I've already stocked up on a bunch of Vallejo, uh, and it's a predominant brand at shops. If you add a paint, you go, oh crap! I'll just go step out the hobby shop, try to resupply. They don't. Mig seems to be a little bit more undersupplied and available than uh, Vallejo. Yeah, definitely, definitely my experience as well. Um, I know one of my local hobby shops uh, 
pretty much just Vallejo and Games Workshop for the paints they stock, and another hobby shop stocks uh, Games Workshop, Tamiya, and Mr. Hobby, which are a couple that we'll cover off on later. So MIG is not really popular in Australian hobby stores in both our experiences, I think it's fair to say, but it's not due to a lack of performance, it's probably just the company hasn't really gone out there to try and uh, really push the market here. Um, Alright, so number four, Badger Miniature Acrylic Paints. Now these are probably the best bang for your buck out of all of the paints available here today because they're not much more than, uh, sorry, they're a lot cheaper than Kane's Workshop, nearly half the price, and you get three times the amount of paint. Have you used much Miniature Cut? Yes. Um, I used a lot of them on my Ultramarines army. And I did use them on some Night Lords as well. Uh, there was some problems with them uh, that some other people have found that they expressed to me, which I haven't actually... I thinned them down with the same technique that I use with Vallejo. Uh, that's with the, um, the thinner, just some water, and I just add the badger paint in there, and it get it to a milky consistency and it works well and those pots are still I still have those pots uh, and yeah they're like even though they come in two sizes they have a larger one as well but yeah the 30 mil ones um, the dropper the nozzle isn't directly to the rim of the black so it does drip occasionally um, there's nothing stopping you from using just a dropper anyway mixing it in a different cup if that's your your thing but I go straight from my hopper from airbrush into the uh, under the miniature basically so that was basically the the small amount the small problem that I had with it it drips slightly if you're not paying attention uh, but that that other than that consistency of the paint is good pigments thin enough and uh, the coverage is good the very pastel colors though I don't think I have, but I, that was the colors that I've bought. I had a lot of the, they're not very bright. Uh, so, yeah, I've, uh, and the price as well. You'll see a lot of people are actually selling them um, very cheap because they're just trying to get rid of their stock. Uh, there's one, I think it was, there was a black that they had that was the pinnacle of the painting world for a while, and I don't think Badger produce it anymore. So those, they, go, they go for notoriously large prices, but yeah, unfortunately I don't have any of that left. <laughs> so, yeah, I've got a lot of their Raven Black. Um, I don't know if that's the black you're referring yeah, to, but that is fantastic. Um, or has performed fantastic for me anyway. I mean, I've used it to uh, like all my uh, Thousand Suns, all the black paintwork on them is pretty much all done with uh, Mini Tear. I had the same problems you did with the fact that the dropper is located in from the rim um, with the paint build up around it usually you get like a you store the paint and then when you open it up next it's like the paint has dried around it and it yeah. creates like this little lip as well which really doesn't help with the uh, the drop issue with the droplets sort of running down the side of it so generally I end up having to like clean up the paint pot a little bit if I haven't used it in a while before I actually put any paint into my spray gun but apart from that they've been pretty good they're standard flat acrylics um, like your whites your blacks your greens your blues they're all great the metallics though I have had a lot of issues with um, when thinned out correctly there's a lot of particulate separation so the little metal flakes that give you the metallic finish seem to really separate out and they don't hold together very well inside the paint so when you spray your miniature, it looks less like a single metallic surface and more like you've just thrown glitter on your model. Yeah, right. Um, now, that's not for all their metallic paints, but it's definitely something I noticed with like their dark bronzes and brasses. Um, and is so... It's, I wouldn't necessarily suggest trying to airbrush these straight in your miniature without doing a fair bit of test work to find out what consistency works best through your airbrush. Uh, and you might even find that it just it doesn't work for your needs. Uh, that's what I found with Minitear. I, I best keep the metallics to things like terrain pieces. Mm. 
Right, number five, AK Interactive. Now, this is from their figure series acrylic, but again, it's just representative of their different acrylics they supply. AK, um, mostly for the sort of scale modeling world, I think it's fair to say. Yeah, I reckon that's that border where you've got hobbyists using a lot of the AK stuff to get their rush streaks or, or dust effects uh, to, to cross over into that uh, from wargaming style painting to modeling style of painting to a realistic effect. I think that there's that border. Uh, and then once people get into this AK kind of stuff and they see uh, the what, what's more available to them, then they can expand it ever outwards. And I think AK provide that easy uh, product to use to get a realistic result. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. Definitely, uh, definitely agree with you. I know the enamels from AK are something I've used quite a bit of. They're weathering enamels, and they're fantastic. Um, obviously, enamels are not the most user-friendly things if you haven't used them before. There's something you either need to do your research on and do a few test minis before you just go sucking on your models, um, especially if you don't varnish your models. You're going to have a real hard time when you put those enamels down and you start rubbing off the acrylic paint that you've painted your miniatures in. Uh, as for the acrylic paints themselves from AK, they've been pretty good in my experience, very similar to Vallejo in performance, but I find they tend to clog the gun a bit more than Vallejo, even with the exact same sort of thinning style. Um, have you had any problems with AK in that? Uh, not putting that through my airbrush, but I've only been using the metallics through it, and that's usually to a milky consistency i've had haven't really had an issue to it but that's not a it's not an acrylic base right right um yeah okay so okay it's good paint um again i definitely wouldn't go for it over my vallejo or i'd probably go for mig before i went for ak if i was going to be replacing my yeah for acrylic paints I'd, I'd agree with that definitely um, for the enamels, though, AK has a brilliant enamel range, so... Alright, moving on to number six, uh, the Army Painter. So, the Army Painter paints uh, have a bit of a funny reputation, I think it's fair to say. Because, quality-wise, they can be a bit all over the shop. But the price is really good, and you get a decent quantity of paint. So, Kat, what are your Army Painter experiences? My Army Painter experiences consist of the dark and light washes i think that that's part that should be staple in everyone's painting repertoire there, there's some great uh washes uh for for furs through to metallics and stuff like that so uh they're fantastic they're cheap and they're readily available in most shops though i do buy them online and like you said they are a good quantity of paint and wash and a dropper bottle as well compared to games workshops um uh, the oil and the non uh, oil and stuff like that, uh, whereas they're prone to tipping over uh, and spilling. This has a dropper bottle for their washes. So for the paints as well, they've had back. Oh, when the hell was that? That would have been when we were both in Townsville still, and I was using them on my Imperial fists. They have color matched acrylic bottle paint to match their uh, aerosol cans so they have aerosol can colored primers so if you need to touch anything up you can pick up a bottle as well with a brush a bottle of acrylic paint which color matches uh, that can so if you're doing something a large quantity of miniatures and you want to get pumped it out fast uh, that with their army paint a wash it, it works wonders and it's, it's very very fast I managed to paint an army out um, out on a bush hike for, for better terms, basically, uh, with minimal um, brushes and stuff like that. So, yeah, uh, definitely recommend them. They are the washes are a mainstay. The paints not so much nowadays since I use other techniques and stuff, and I've kind of uh, grown uh, as a hobbyist beyond that. But yeah, the washes still definitely uh, a go-to. How about yourself? Yeah, um, 
I've used a lot of their spray paints and I've used a lot of their paints. In fact, I have a, quite a big set of uh, acrylics from Army Painter in the dropper bottles. And I have to say, overall, I've been pretty happy with them. But the big word of warning I've got to give with both their spray paints and their dropper bottles is shake, shake, shake. You really need to mix this stuff every fucking time you use it. Uh, a lot of times you go to grab the army paint and paint, you're, you're working on a model, and you're like, oh, I need to add a quick drop of white or something to this colour I'm mixing up to do a highlight. And you squeeze it out and instead of paint coming out, instead you get some of the additive uh, comes out. So it's like a clear watery sort of substance comes out of the bottle and no pigment. And you're like, oh fuck. And you can squeeze that bottle all day and what's happened is a separation has occurred inside it and you just get uh, all the pigment has settled in the bottom of the drop bottle and all the medium that it floats in has floated to the top. Uh, that's a real problem. So you need to shake the crap out of these paints a lot more than I find with uh, MIG or Vallejo or Miniatear in order to get a good performance out of them. Uh, further to that, their spray cans, if you do not shake those fucking things right, you will ruin your army. Um, how would you describe it, Cat? Like a furry sort of finish? Because Yeah, so I've had that, especially in Townsville, where the humidity could get up to like, you know, 180%. Uh, so when you're trying to undercoat something with anything, that's, you know, the worst time. So the problem was I was getting with that and I did some research and asked some of the suppliers. The paint was actually drying before it hit the miniature uh, in the air and basically clumping together and would make it look furry. So once I closed that distance, and I'm only talking about 10 centimeters, I was doing that and I was getting a huge furry result because the humidity dried that paint. Uh, you got to... I was almost doing uh, short bursts at uh, only a couple of inches away from the miniatures and I was getting a smooth result with uh, minimal loss of detail. So yeah, that um, the, their paint, their aerosol paint, if that's still, that was many years ago now, that could have been, yeah, that's many years ago now, talking over five, six years. So uh, yeah, they, they might have changed their recipe, but if that is occurring and you're getting a fuzzy you can't also always always test the surface. You don't have to test it on miniature. Just test the surface on, on a piece of paper. Make sure one it's the right color. You know you didn't accidentally pick up a wrong color. Uh, make sure the paint isn't you know screwing you over. It's always a good idea to test just a, a spray and be all like you know get your bearings. So yeah, definitely just try either closing that distance if you're getting that uh, fairy effect. Yep, I, I've had that furry effect recently, but as you said at the end there, test it out first. I always spray a piece of cardboard, I leave it in my sort of spray paint area outside. Um, spray that bit of cardboard, if it's furry, keep shaking it. You maybe move the bottle closer to the source I'm trying to paint. You know, play with a few different ideas first before you go fuck it and spray your miniatures, or else it could end pretty badly for you. Yeah, I didn't at the first time, so I had to, uh, you know strip an entire Imperial Fist army, so Red lessons repeat. learned. Alright, uh, so seventh option on our list here is Tamiya. Now Tamiya are not the sort of acrylics you want to go mixing water with. We'll just get that out of the way straight away. <laughs> I mean you can, but I guarantee it is not going to work out well for you. Uh, Kat, what are your experiences with Tamiya? Uh, I've used them I still use them, uh, uh, I wouldn't say, uh, I would say occasionally, I use them occasionally now, I definitely use the, um, the clear red for blood effects, uh, you do need to use an alcohol cleaner, alcohol based cleaner to obviously thin and clean your equipment, and thin the paint, clean, clean your equipment. Uh, other than that, it's, um, yeah, that's, that's basically what I do. That's what I've used it for, uh, primarily. Uh, and back in the day when I used to paint uh, aircraft uh, with just a brush, I'd use this, uh, the Tamiya, and get a nice solid solid effect. But now that the acrylics are more available, and it's not the 90s anymore, and Tamiya are not the leading paint company as they used to be, uh, yeah, they've... Um, but they're still definitely big in the... Uh, you know, uh, 
military hobby uh, style stuff and race cars and stuff like that, uh, especially in Japan. Uh, it's still one of the top things. I use their putties a lot as well for filling. And yeah, do yeah, you they use do your have a good two part putty, don't they? Yeah, they've got multiple different types. So whatever you're looking for, you can usually find something that suits that uh, application. You use this for your Thousand Suns army, right? Yes, I exclusively. And for your and uh, for iron your hands. iron hands, yes, yeah, which are up on the outer circle Instagram. So if you want to check Insta that G. out, Insta G, the gram, the Insta, the Instagram, the gram jeans. Yeah, all so the check that out. Go. I usually try and take uh, photos of my work so that my my chest is in shot, my manly breasts. Um, because I hear that doing that gets more views. I've actually noticed the opposite trend. But anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, I've I've used a lot of Tamiya. I really like Tamiya. I, in fact, I think they provide some of the best paint surfaces on a miniature. Uh, their metallics, their uh, flat acrylics, all can provide excellent results on standard miniatures. However, you've got to know what you're doing with it if you want to achieve those results. A lot of award-winning painters use Tamiya for their foundation layers, only to swapping to something like Vallejo um, or MIG when they're getting to like those uh, wet blending or the final highlight phases, but they need a lot of fine control that they can very easily get with other paints. Um, where they'll do their base coats mostly with like Tamiya. So, as Kat said, I painted, I've painted something like fucking twelve and a half thousand points now of like thousands of sands, iron hands, and a few other things. Um, some Alpha Legion with Tamiya's paints, they work brilliantly. Uh, the X twenty A acrylic thinners is fantastic. I use it for all my airbrushing needs. Um, I've away home Mig, Minitair. It's the thinner of choice I go with. Um, they also make a lacquer thinner, which is what you want to use with like your clear reds and those sort of paints. Now, obviously, Tamiya is quite a hard one, as you said, to clean out your airbrush. So you've got to have like some of that lacquer thinner or a good airbrush cleaner if you're going to put this stuff through your airbrush, if you want to get it all out. Otherwise, you're going to be tainting the next paint you put in. Um, I think probably the big downside of these paints over Games Workshop is they're very close in price um, and you get the same amount of paint as Games Workshop. And Glass it, bottle too, so depending on how you store your paint, if you're just putting it all in a big box and it's getting shaken around, probably not the best uh, ideal place for them. No, but on the bright side, it does seal a lot better than Games Workshop's bottles. And these yeah, are anything over does. thanks to the heavier bottle with the uh, very wide base. So uh, I think Gangs Workshop in a way wins over Tamiya for the simple fact that their paints are easy for the novice to use. But for a skilled painter, Tamiya will probably reward you more, I think. Uh, Alright, so that leaves us with one more paint on today's list. And that's Mr. Hobby. So, have you used Mr. Hobby? And if so, uh, how have you found it? Yeah, I've used some clear coats from Mr. Hobby and also, again, clear reds. It just seems to be a cheaper alternative to Tamiya. I've, and uh, I've gotten them as presents uh, from people. So, yeah, they, it's the same as Tamiya uh, in my experiences. And I also have an olive drab green that I could not find any other color to, to match. So that worked out well. Um, yeah, they have a water-based one as well, but a small, small container. So I don't know. I just, I wouldn't effectively go at it. It's, a, it's really more of a last resort for me uh, rather than, oh, they have... A specific thing that I want. How about you? You find yourself using this a lot? I do not use it a lot at all, but what I do find is uh, for some reason, like you mentioned, they have these weird colors that I can't seem to find anywhere else. Um, they have this really fantastic vibrant metallic green, for example, that I found. Which uh, okay. I needed to paint some metallic green uh, striping onto some Mechanicum models. 
and it was just the perfect metallic green. Like I didn't have to lay down a silver and then put like a clear green over the top or something like that. I didn't have to mix my own metallic green. Um, I was able to just grab this Mr. Hobby one straight out of the bottle and it was just perfect, you know. Um, it thinned mm -hmm. down fine through the airbrush, um, was easy to apply and I have not touched it since. So, um, it worked well, but yeah, I think Mr. Hobby stuff, it's, it's cheap. Uh, you don't get a great amount of paint. They're generally glass bottles as well, it's very much the style of Tamiya. But they're really only good for colour matching those weird shades you can't seem to find anywhere else. Uh, because it just seems to be a weird thing with Mr. Hobby. They have, uh, yeah, these really weird shades that are brilliant, but nobody else seems to make. Yep. Uh, two other paint brands. One that I haven't tried and I'd like to test out would be Turbo Dork. They have a bunch of acrylic uh, metallics uh, with a lot of shape shifting colors. So green, blue, purple, pink, stuff like that. Uh, it looks, I really want to test those out. They're pretty expensive. You're looking at $6 US per bottle, but they're in a larger bottle than the Leho, I believe. It's about 20, 30 mil at least. Uh, another one that I have used and I do recommend in dropper bottles, great price uh, comparatively to GW and the other ones on the list there would be Reaper Miniatures and yes, they also I have some great uh, Reaper, sorry. combo paints as well for like either painting skin uh, or, or armors and stuff like that so uh, and some tutorials as well that you could just uh, follow the bouncing ball, get what you need to create the result you're looking for. Is there any other ones you want to add, Mega? Um, well, I was just going to say on the Reaper one, they're one I haven't tried yet, which is obviously why they're not on this list of paints today. These are paints that we've both used um, on the main list. Reaper, I think, are 20 mil bottles, uh, not 17s like the others here. And um, another paint brand which I have tried using uh, with mixed success is the Alclads. Um where basically there are like a metallic tint or a, a tint that you put over enamel metallic paints uh, and you can get these like beautiful candies they're uh, used a lot in like model cars because you get these beautiful uh, like true to life coloring on cars um, downside is they're quite difficult to work with um, they're also something i discovered because i did try them on my thousand suns mastodon um, because it was a bigger surface with a lot of flat, or well, bigger miniature with a lot of flat surfaces, um, I found it did not colour match very well with like other candy reds. It had a lot more purplish tinges to it. Um, mm -hmm. and it was quite a difficult paint to work with overall. So I think I need a lot more practice with it, but definitely for people who are trying to get like a, a really nice metallic finish, if you can perfect it, it's probably the nicest metallic finish possible from a paint. Nice. So that about wraps us up, I think, today. Um, anything else you think is worth adding to this episode? Um, just for your mixing paints thing, just going back to that, I add. I have a little bit of uh, a little bottle of glass beads that I got from a hobby shop. That every time that I am using my paints, uh, I just. For the first time opening them, I'll just take the uh, pipette part off and drop a glass bottle as an uh, glass ball correction uh, in there as an agitator, just to help mix up the paint. Yeah, don't use um, steel, stainless steel, or brass, bronze, any of those type of uh, ball bearings or beads, because they will not work well with your paints. Um, and be careful with plastic beads because certain paints may eat into those plastic beads and it will end up very badly for all those involved. Um, yeah, the reason we don't use metallic beads is because they corrode, which obviously will change the colouring of your pigment, but also you can have fine particles of, you know, matter like steel, for example, fine steel rust particles. Uh, they're not something you want going through your air gun because they will damage the nozzle, they will damage the needle. Uh, I think that's always worth saying on that point. Yeah, man. So thanks everyone for watching this episode. Um, 
as I said at the start, it's not about hating GW, it's about giving you facts. We give you a lot more facts than you guys think. Uh, that's why we like to provide our sources and show you on screen the maths. So you can see, you know, how much are prices of things going up each year. How much uh, is Games Workshop charging next to the competition. And I think we've pretty conclusively shown that everyone else is offering paint that are like 80% of a price or cheaper. And they're offering more paint for that price as well. And they are definitely on par or better paints than Games Workshop. The great hobby crime that Games Workshop has committed, more than their price hikes and things like that, is convincing hobbyists that they're the best manufacturer of these sort of things in the world. They are not. I'm not saying they're bad. They, they make very good paints. I mean, they dry up a lot, but they're good paints. But the competition are giving you equal quality with more paint or cheaper paint. So why would you go Games Workshop? Especially because so many of these brands um, they colour match to Games Workshop's paints and they also um, provide like spray paints, things like that, that also colour match to Games Workshop paints. So there's really no reason to go Games Workshop at all. Yeah, if they made a you know better product and was in competition with all these other prices, why, why would I... I'd go with Citadel for sure. There, there are a couple of Citadel items I do buy that are hard to match with products. It's one, one or two paints that I, I do use, but for the most part, I, why would I go with a more expensive brand for less? Uh, and in most cases, a poorer quality because it's just going to, well, the poorer quality of the bottle at least, or it's just going to dry up. So it's like going to the supermarket, right? Why would you, why would you be loyal to a brand of milk or, or a brand of uh, biscuits when someone's either offering you more better quality? Like, I I don't understand the standing where if people try to use the moral standing of oh, but James Workshop do so much for us, so we've got to treat it like a charity. Like, it's a business; it's not a charity. They've got to win your business. They don't deserve your business. Yeah, they're not doing anything for you. They don't give you free things. They make you pay for everything. So, um, you know, you, you don't owe them shit. If they want your money, they have to give you a surface you think is worth your money. And, well, frankly, it's up to anyone to decide what they think is worth it or not. I can't tell you what is or isn't worth it. But Yeah, because val value is subjective, right? Definitely. Sure, I sure. agree with that. Um, but by that same token... Uh, what is Games Workshop offering in, say, a corn red paint over, say, a red that Vallejo offers? If Vallejo is doing the same red and it's cheaper and things like that, maybe they're worth actually having a look in instead of Games Workshop. Uh, blind brand loyalty causes all sorts of problems. Uh, we see it in cars and we see it in computing. But Apple is a fantastic example of blind brand loyalty where you have all the same hardware in, like, a MacBook as another laptop, and the other laptop is half the price of the MacBook. But because it's got that Apple logo on it, people just dive at it. Um, that said, I fucking hate MacBooks. So <laughs> Macintosh operating systems are shit house. Um, yeah, I mean that that you hit an interesting point there, Mac. Uh, there's some people that go to GW and paint. Now and that could very well be the same kind of style, or or akin to somebody going into a cafe to write their grand novel on their, their MacBook Pro at, at the Soy Latte Cafe, right? You, you want to go into a games workshop and you want to paint your miniatures? You better believe your ass all you're pulling out of that thing is Citadel paint. And it might be a it's social Citadel standing brushes. thing. Mm, absolutely. Some of those things are going for 70 bucks now. Some of those Citadel brushes are $70. What the hell? Uh, we should do an episode on this sometime about brushes, but... Uh, yeah, well, in, in any case, so you've got these guys that are there and they're pulling out the Citadel paints. It could be a social standing thing. Of the person who has more of the Citadel paints has, has a higher social standing in, in that setting. I, I can't know for sure, but I'm guessing that's how that works. I, I doubt that you'd be seeing a lot of uh, Vallejo MIG or AK uh, or, or a lot of Badger stuff uh, coming out on the table. Me, the red shirt noticed me. I don't know whether they do still... The managers or the staff there even wear red shirts anymore. I'm quite no, certain black it's now. black now. Oh, but, there you go. Yeah. Jet? 
brand could have changed the brand. Yeah, Just like yeah. Apple, right? When they went from all this stylish color, cool, cool stuff of of being hip and stuff to to dull grays and blacks and whites and stuff like that. It's sleek and futuristic. Sleek. Yeah, man. That's why it's the bottle so small because it's sleek, low drag. Yeah, it's uh, uh, so sleek. In fact, that it uh, dries out the paint. In any case, <laughs> um, yeah. Thanks everyone for watching the episode. Hope you actually found this informative. Um, it's not just a rant, as we said. We try to give you a lot of information about these brands, the pros, the cons, and the fact that we have both used them uh, because we can bounce ideas off each other. So yeah, let us know what you guys have used in the comments, some alternates to Games Workshop paints that you found really good. Oh, you know, tell us why we're wrong. Feel free to head over to our Facebook page as well. There'll be links in the description below and also Instagram. So you can tell us how wrong we are on uh, those platforms too. That's right. You can tell us we're wrong in four different dimensions, I believe, currently. Uh, we're working on getting people to file complaints in a fifth dimension, but it hasn't happened yet. We're in also on uh, Discord and Steam if you'd like to uh, hit us up on that as well. So thanks everyone for watching the episode. Uh, from me, goodbye. And from Kat. I'll catch you next time.